This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 186, and today is June 1st, 2012. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the world's most popular talk show about viruses. You hear the giggling. You hear the massive numbers of people giggling. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I almost forgot your name. It's been so long since I said it. <laughs> oh, come on. I haven't been out there. that long. Well, what, last week I, uh, you guys uh, weren't here. That's all. That's right. So two weeks seems like an, an eon. How have you been, yeah. Alan? Good? Doing well. Are you yeah. working hard? Very hard. Been uh, traveling all over the place, but uh, that'll that'll come to an end soon, and then uh, hopefully I'll stay put for a little while. All right. And it's cloudy there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little cloudy. It's uh, kind of nice today, uh, upper 70s Fahrenheit, but um, uh, supposed to be pouring rain all weekend. Nice. Yeah. Tough. So I got my lawn mowing done already. You did it today? Uh, no, I did it yesterday. Uh See, you stay home, you can do that. Exactly, I, I, exactly. I, I got to do it. I hear Sunday, it might be okay. Okay. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. How hey, are you, Rich? I'm good. Are you going sailing? Uh, not this weekend, but uh, let me see what this weekend is like. The We're going on the 8th, 9th. That'll be next weekend. We're going to go on another... Over the weekend sale. Cool. Sounds good. We brought our yeah. boat we brought our boat down to the water. All right. Got it out of the garage, which I'm really happy about. Get my garage back. Excellent. Has it been launched yet? No, it hasn't Have been. You sailed it? All right. No, it has to be rigged and I don't know. All right. Probably not this weekend because it's gonna rain. It'll be a while. But looking forward to it. All right. So let's see. Today we have all email. Which should be fun. We got a lot of email. We're just not going to get all to it. But um, yeah, it's been a while since we've done an email show, hasn't it? It has uh, one sixty something, I think. Okay. And um, but we'll we'll do it. We have some follow ups though. One eighty five, which I did in Northwestern University School of Medicine in Chicago. It was a great trip. We had a nice little room, which was packed. It was about fifty people. It's really nice. Everyone came to see it. We had a cool. good, uh, good, good panel. And Kurt writes. Kurt is uh, from. I, I, good, good of me. I, I cut his name out here. <laughs> Kurt Horvath is from Northwestern. He's a professor uh, out there, and he writes, "Dear Vincent, sorry I missed your visit. My teaching duties in Evanston prevented it." Several of my students attended both and had good reports all around, so I gave a seminar as well as a TWIV. I just today listened to the TWIV netcast myself, and not only did I understand the mighty Monty Python references, but I wanted to give the answer to one mystery. I was the former student who framed the Maxim Gilbert combs for Bob Lamb. In fact, there are two, one made by Bob and the other made by me. I needed more wells, as I recall. Little did I know that I passed the sniff test back then. Those 50 base pairs were hard won and very costly compared with the ease of deep sequencing today. Hope to see you next time. I don't know if you guys have listened, but... Uh, uh, I have not finished the episode yet, but I've listened to most, most of it. And I found the reminiscences about sequencing just terrific, you know, because, <laughs> the, the you, know, you know, war stories are a big part of this business okay and and as you pointed out towards the end of that everyone listening if they're you know, everyone listening to the war stories if they're bored to tears they will you know a couple of decades from now have their own war stories and um you know they're really terrific i remember sequencing evolving as a matter of fact i don't know if i've mentioned it on this show before but i was in uh the icrf in london when this uh, was being developed, and before it was published, we had uh, Fred Sanger come down and give a seminar. Mm. And uh, uh, gels that could resolve oligonucleotides 
that differed in length by a single base pair, I just nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> and the notion that, you know, we'd, we'd, I grew up in an RNA sequencing laboratory, and we'd spent a lot of time trying to figure out how you could sequence DNA. And it's one of these things when you're all done, it's so elegantly simple. And in the end, you're just reading the sequence up this film. It's unbelievable. You know, Great stuff. Yeah. You know, when, once something gets started, then it moves along really quickly. It happens a lot. Did you get the Monty Python? Uh, no, uh, no. As a matter of fact, what movie is that from? I don't know, but Bob Lamb did. It's the Dead Parrot. Yeah. Was, was where, that? You know, um, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't watch. I haven't watched any except the one with the rabbit that kills you. Yeah. Yeah, I think it yeah. might. Have, maybe it was Meaning of Life with the yeah. Dead Parrot. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've seen the Meaning of Life. I'm. Just Unless it was one of the TV skits. My Netflix queue. Well, Bob needs to... I don't know if Bob even listens to Twib, but somebody will write in and tell us where the dead yeah, parrot no, Bob comes doesn't. from. I, I wanted to get Bob on for a while because he's a, uh, he's he a good He was very talker. articulate. He was, yeah. he was terrific. He, uh, just, he just goes on. He's great. By the way, yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, he made the point that really caught my attention that uh, if I heard him correctly... Um, it's what I believe, and that is the difference between somebody who can make something work in the lab and somebody who can't, all mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's, it's all about paying attention. Yep. Paying just really attention to what you're doing, not just slopping stuff around, but really paying attention to every last detail. And the interesting thing is when you start doing something and it doesn't work or doesn't work well, and then three months later you're doing it and it's just beautiful and you you – compare then and now and you don't know what's different just subtle little changes and it's all because you pay attention yeah you got to pay attention that's what uh kurt's referring to by the sniff test bob said right. students who could do that sequencing right. were good because that took a lot of attention all right the next one is about 184 which was our discussion of reforming science jameson writes wow this episode is bookmarked for re-listening I was really drawn into the scope and frank discussion of core concepts that literally run the world of science as I have come to know it. I have always admired Vincent and company's opinion regarding the need for openness and transparency of science, but even then I had no idea how incredibly dire the need was until it was ranked in terms that your average Joe could digest. I assume that the 21st century system for funding disseminating and application of scientific research is primarily based on universally grounded principles itself, and it appears that it is just not so. Competition is an essential tool for some areas of science. How much did we gain as an aside because Edison and Tesla's ideas fought for supremacy? Nevertheless, it can also cost us unmeasured leaps in human progress when we waste effort competing for the same end. Brilliant astronauts and cosmonauts died fruitlessly because governments defined the benefits of competition as gospel rather than dynamic. Discouraging cooperation, collaboration of data among scientific experts is irrational, far beyond sharing the vapid benefits of prestige and wealth a hundred times over. In words that make the most sense to a taxpayer like me, why the hell isn't the science of science based on the science of science? There is no shades of gray here. There are none. A scientist should believe that data and research are either open source or closed-minded, period. I like that one. It's a forceful email. Yes. Yeah. I read it appropriately. Thank you, Jameson. That was actually on the website, but I thought it was worth reading. Mm -hmm. All right. So I sent emails to both Arturo Casadeval and Ferrick Fang after our that episode, because I thought they should know about it, because they're not going to find it on their own, right? Uh -huh. Right. So, Ferrick wrote, Arturo and I are thrilled and honored that you featured our essays on reforming science in TWIV. I listened to the entire netcast this evening and thoroughly enjoyed your thoughtful and entertaining discussion with Rich and Alan. Arturo is presently traveling and heard it earlier today from Madrid. We certainly understand the general pessimism about achieving a wholesale reform of science. Nevertheless, we are encouraged by the general interest expressed by scientific leaders such as yourselves and hope that momentum can build for substantive changes that will make science better. By the way, my parents named me Farrick because they had decided to give all of their kids names starting with the letter F 
and wanted a strong name for their number one son, Iron. I'm just grateful they chose the more stable oxidation state. Excellent. <laughs> Could have chosen another F word, too, and that would have been yes. a problem. Could That's have, pretty cool. It would have been a problem. And Arturo wrote, hello from Madrid, where I had the pleasure of listening to the webcast. I thought the discussion was superb. Although I agree with you that change would be incredibly difficult, I believe it is possible because the young people in science are so dissatisfied with the system. Everywhere I go, reform is the major topic that people want to talk about. We are working on a set of specific ideas. For example, imagine if the Nobel Prizes were given for a human accomplishment instead of to a person. What would this do to the economics of science? Imagine if the past year, the Nobel Foundation had given a prize for the discovery of toll-like receptors instead of singling out two people and leaving a lot out. What if collaborative papers were given higher value in promotion process than papers from a single lab? Simple changes could have tremendous impact. I am not naive enough to think that this would be easy, but to me the fact that you and your guests talk about this is already progress for discussion is always the beginning. Again, thank you for bringing attention and new perspective to the problem. Excellent. Great. What would you do with the Nobel money if you gave it to a field? They have, uh, when I first read this, I thought, oh, that can't possibly work. But then I realized they, they've given the prize in the past. I think they've given it to organizations. So TWIV, so TWIV is an organization. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, seriously, they've, um, I think there was some anti-landmine charity that they gave it to a few years ago and there 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 have been some other some organizations it's not always given to specific people sure yeah. so there's kind of a precedent for recognizing collaborative effort already at least outside the sciences that's usually the peace prize that that gets that but um why not you know in the sciences say hey this is for for uh for discovery of rnai or this is for discovery of toll-like receptors yeah. Great idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it could be in the form of some sort of collaborative grant or something like that. Yeah, or in terms of the money, you know, have uh, um usually by the time the prize is given out, there are fairly obvious nonprofit targets that you could uh, you could aim it at. Mhm. Mm um, of course, that's only a part of the problem. Yes, that's but, just one uh, small piece, but that's it, small pieces are going to be how you yeah. get this thing rolling. <clears throat> All right, then we had said, young guys, uh, tell us how you feel. And we said, Matt and Matt respond, Matt Freeman and Matt Evans. So Matt wrote us a, an email here. Matt Freeman. Yeah, Matt, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. And Matt, <laughs> Mev, Matt Evans. I saw Matt on Wednesday, Matt Evans, and he's going to come on TWIV in the near future and just say it in person. So Matt writes, hello, podcast pioneers, virology guild members. I listened to TWIV 184 on reforming science last week and heard the call out to hear my experiences with the life of a young scientist. If you talk to anyone that knows me in science, they will tell you that I love, love, love this gig. I think it's amazing to have a job where you are doing things on a daily basis that no one has ever done before. And when you get a piece of data, it is an answer that no one else in the world has. It is a truly remarkable enterprise that we work in, and I get to share this love of science with students, techs, and postdocs every day. It is also true, this is a rough game sometimes. As a PI, you are constantly being rejected by reviewers of grants and papers who deem your stories insufficient for one reason or another. I am in a constant standoff between spending time writing papers or grants and doing science. Now with my own lab, unfortunately, it is mostly the students and techs doing the work, and I get to spend more time at the desk, which I do not enjoy. However, it is part of the game we all play. The other part of the gig that you talk about are the issues with publishing and funding. There is great competition for an ever-shrinking piece of the funding pie. We have been blessed with an R01 for my research, which allows us to breathe a bit and take the time to do the work the right way instead of rushing to get data for grants. It also allows us to develop complete stories for papers rather than rushing out small crappy papers just to build up a CV list for grant review. As discussed in the articles, there is a huge explosion in the number of journals, meaning that more crap science can be published in journals that no one reads, again, to just make your CV heavier. 
As for grant reviews, they're getting pickier and pickier. He didn't talk about the numbers in the show, but there are basically only two to three grants per study section that get funded from smaller labs. The other four to five grants go to the big labs that already have multiple grants and contracts. I have also heard from people on study section that as a new investigator, the chance that I will get a second R01 shortly after receiving my first R01 is slim to none. I still try because I like to prove people wrong, but I know the next R01 has to have a fully developed story backed by two to three papers before it is going to get a funded score. Another big problem, which is touched on in the papers, is that the next generation of scientists, those in graduate school now, do not want to go into academic science. In my experience, most aren't even considering academic postdocs. They see the other professors scraping for cash from NIH or other assorted agencies. They think that they will have no chance of getting grants for their own lab, since all the big cheese labs are also scrambling and fighting for the same cash. It is those like myself who are stubborn enough to be to keep getting back up when you are told no over and over again. The good news is that everyone is being told no all the time in this game. However, the future of science will have to change soon to accommodate the changing times. I don't know what the answer is. I do think there should be a cap on the amount of NIH money a lab can get. I do think that there should be more money for training grants for students and postdocs, which will alleviate stress on labs. I do think that we need to talk to the public more about what science does for them. It is time to get past the next great cancer cure BS that shows up on the Today Show every week. That is not helping our cause with the public. Educating people to how science really works is the key. Carl Zimmer and Ed Young do this very well every day. Students out there in high school and college need to be shown how awesome it is to work in a lab. I still have a picture of my first DNA gel I ever ran. Kids are all techies now. We don't have to dumb it down very much to get them interested. It's time to initiate a new wave of creative and intelligent kids into the guild that we practice on a daily basis. And hopefully, by the time they get to grad school, we will have this whole funding, publishing, grant review mess figured out. Okay, time to finish my plaque essay. <laughs> nice. That's a nice, you know, uh, realistic, but nevertheless, in its own way, upbeat letter. Yeah, he yeah. loves it. He you loves know? it, man. It, he, you know, the the passion that he um, describes is what carries you through the crap. Okay, but what if you tried five, six, seven, eight years and didn't get that first R one? He started to get d discouraged, right? Yeah. So you got to have money to do your work. Yeah. yeah. My proposal is: current NIH budget is thirty billion, hundred billion. Figure out how to pay for it, guys. Good investment. <laughs> it is a good investment. I think um, the the things Matt is pointing to, which were also in the article we discussed, are are practical steps, though, that could be implemented in the near term. Um, this idea of capping grants per lab, I, I think that's a really great idea. Um, and it's not going to free up an extra sixty billion dollars, but it's going to distribute the money in a way that is uh, that is probably going to be both more productive for science and also more sustainable. Yeah, I think uh, I think you know new money would really help, but I also think that uh, a careful look at the budget could move some money from, in particular, targeted areas to more fundamental R01 driven research. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not just waving a white flag on the new money thing. I don't think that it's going to get very far, but I, I, I would agree we should keep saying, you know, this is an investment you're making. You, you've shortchanged this, and you really hose the whole country right. um, and the world, for that matter. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, I think we have to kind of look at our own house and say, well, of the money we're getting, are we spending it in the best possible way? And I, and I think that could, that could use some reworking. All right, I admit, I spend two hours a week uh, doing TWIV. It's all on NIH money. That's not really the problem. <laughs> I do, actually, only half of my salary is paid by NIH, so I could chalk it up to Columbia. All right, let's do some new email. And, Alan, please take the first one. Sure. Uh, Thomas writes, Hello, Vincent, Alan, Dixon, and Auxiliaries. Uh, I've come across this apparently new Bunya virus that emerged in Germany recently. And he gives a link uh, to a publication. <clears throat> um, I think this is from the um, uh, European CDC, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
yeah. New Orthobunia virus isolated from infected cattle and small livestock. Um, and I believe we talked about this, didn't we? We've at least mentioned it. I don't think we've done a thorough job on it yet because it's really in its uh, infancy. Right. Um, right. He we, says, uh, see, see, let me just finish right, the letter. Right. Seems like a pretty strange virus. Hope you guys can do a twiv on it because it might, may, might make humans sick too. Greetings from China. So we talked with the Richard Elliott at Twiv Dublin a couple of weeks ago. About mm-hmm. he, oh, that's right. He's a bunny guy. Right. And he's got the virus and working on it, but it's still early. We, it's about everything we know we talked about in that episode. I asked him all the questions I could think of, so. Right, so this is the Schmallenberg virus, is mm-hmm. how it's yep. better known. Schmallenberg. Yes. It's making cattle and cattle and sheep sick. And right. um, Fouchier had a name since it was isolated first in Germany. I said we should call it no name virus, and he said that in German, which I've forgotten. You know German, Rich? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, kein kein Name, kein Namen, or something like that. Okay. I I no but, German is you know that's <laughs> pretty shaky. I but we already, don't we already have sin nombre virus? Yeah, we need it in German, though, don't we? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, Rich, please take the next one. Uh, right. Jeff writes, Hey, Twiv, this is an article I came across and thought of you guys. Uh, and this is a Scientific American article that describes how uh, whereas HIV used to be the biggest uh, viral killer, now hepatitis C has surpassed it, both because hep C has become increasingly a problem and also because we're uh, slowly but surely getting HIV more under control. Your podcast is great. I was listened to about half of the TWIV ones in, over, uh, in the past month or so. Thanks for your service. So That's so a nice Scientific American article. Matt said that the new generation of hep C drugs, now there's, there's another generation still in the pipeline. He said those are even better than the new ones that just came out. Right. So it should be even better. The next one is from Neva, who writes, Hi, fellas. Vince, Dixon, Allen, and Rich. Get that from you, Rich. I guess. Once again, I must say I love your podcasts. Thank you for sharing them. Below is the URL for a blog post from my dear friend Ken Wilson of Dripping Springs, Texas. He is a person of many talents and interests, including expert silversmithing collections of antique photographs, documents, and postcards, kayaking, and Texas history. This blog entry describes finding a shard of pottery that leads to the tale of an incredibly successful financially malaria and what ails you cure, William Radham's microbe killer a patent snake oil medicine created in the 1880s by William Radham, a Texas nurseryman who had previously invented several potions to kill blight and fungi on plants. Sadly, as you mentioned, in a recent TWIP, snake oil products, especially for malaria in Africa, are still a thriving business. Hope you find this interesting. I found this fascinating. It's a cool story. It's a really great story. (laughs) Yeah, he finds a a shard of an old pot and... um, finds a story connected to it that turns out to be a crock. <laughs> Good, great. Alan. All right. Uh, I like the uh, end of this because I like it when charlatans are exposed. Uh, Radham's heirs, he, Radham, the guy who invented this stuff, died a rich man in 1902. His heirs continued to make money from the sales of the killer, but in 1912, an amendment to the Pure uh, Pure Food and Drugs Act made deception in labeling illegal, and his potion was determined to be mostly water with a little red wine and dashes of hydrochloric and sulfuric acids. (laughs) It was worthless as a medicine, and the lucrative business quickly came to an end. There you go. Of course, nowadays, if you were just more careful about the labeling you would be able to continue selling it. Uh, you can find all kinds you know, so <laughs> find all kinds of stuff out there. Yep. Alan, please you are next. Yes. Uh, so Simon writes, Hi Twiv. Firstly, brilliant show. It is very informative and easy to listen to. I've only just downloaded and started listening to the podcast, so I'm catching up. If this topic has already been discussed, please let me know. I'd like to make a suggestion for a show topic. Viruses, infectious diseases and hygiene. What I'd like to hear about is your experiences with viruses in terms of what protection is needed in the lab. Have you any experience in the higher biosafety levels? What viruses are kept in the various safety levels and why? What happens if someone's accidentally infected by an agent in a lab? 
Are they isolated there and then? I think it is interesting from a public health perspective to know the process of virus handling safety and how these procedures um, can be used to influence public behavior during pandemics. During the 2009 swine flu pandemic, we were advised here in the UK to use alcohol gel frequently and cough into the elbow rather than hand, etc. This was intended to impair the spread of influenza. Are governmental guidelines sound, or should an individual do more during a pandemic, i.e. stay home, avoid crowded places, etc.? What measures did you take during the 2009 pandemic? What hygiene measures would you recommend or have you used for infectious diseases, particularly in public transport? On another note, when someone is tested for antibodies, how exactly does the procedure work? Does the researcher look for a specific antibody, or is there a testing method that lists and displays the antibodies found in a sample? Okay, and Simon is a geologist. So, Rich, you provided a good link here on biosafety levels. Uh, yes, there's a, a Wikipedia link that describes all of the different biosafety levels. From There's four of them, from BSL-1 to BSL-4. BSL-1 is basically uh, working with stuff that can't harm humans at all and um, requires little, if anything, in terms of you know personal protection or protection from the room. BSL-2, I can't really uh, recount them all. It's there, you know, in yeah. a wiki. But BSL-2, BSL-2, I think, is probably the most common. It's for uh, things from which there is a minor hazard uh, for um, uh, infecting humans. What they say, uh, let me see. Uh, similar to BSL-1, suitable for work involving agents of moderate potential hazard <clears throat> to personnel and environment. Interestingly, among the viruses, it includes uh, Hep A, B, C, Flu A, mumps, measles, HIV, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting. Yeah, HIV um, is there because it's not respiratory transmitted. Right. So right. You, you can contain it pretty well in a BSL two. Right. And uh, you know, on vaccinia virus, we work in BSL two conditions. Yeah, so, so, so we do too. We do polio, rhino, et cetera, at BSL two. So now, we keep we keep the lab doors closed. We use biological safety cabinets. We take uh, precautions for protecting ourselves, um, but there's no extreme uh, measures taken to try and contain the agent. And we do have plans. We have to file with our biosafety committee mm -hmm. uh, periodically what to do in the case of a spill with every virus that we work with. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, what procedures you would take, what you would do with the person. It's all laid out in this plan, which has to be filed and updated and so forth. So there are various procedures. And if there are antivirals or vaccines for whatever you're working with, that has to be included. Uh, but if there aren't any, then you have to say that. And you know, if you have a spill, you have to write how you get rid of it and so forth. If you want to know more about a BSL-4, you should keep listening because in September sometimes we're going to visit one in Boston. Yes, looking forward to that. And they will explain. The plan, I think, is to have the people running it explain exactly. We're going to go inside with video and they'll explain exactly That'd how it works. That'd be great. That'd be yeah. great. And uh, so that's going to happen sometime in September. Hopefully we'll coordinate it with the 200th TWIV. As far yeah. as, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and in terms of, um, you know, doing this uh, public health and public hygiene, uh, the recommendations in the swine flu pandemic are the pretty standard, you know, wash your hands, kind of try not to try to not to cough on people. Um, there were, in many, many areas, there were recommendations to um, avoid going to crowded places if you don't have to. Um, that wasn't necessarily official recommendation <laughs> everywhere. I think a lot of people did it. <clears throat> um, so those measures, there's um, there's varying evidence for how how successful they are against um, influenza. They uh, are certainly effective against a, a variety of other pathogens, um, and probably a good idea. Um, right. You'd you'd rather have a vaccine, but if you don't. These are measures that you can take to decrease your chances of getting an infectious disease. Yeah, I mean, he says, what should you do during a pandemic? If there's a vaccine, take the vaccine. Yes, that's the first thing absolutely. I would do. Yeah, that's I mean, the first but, choice. You know, if you're hacking away and it's flu season, you, you don't try not to go where other people are until the coughing subsides. You know, it's really not a good idea. That's how infections spread. 
And don't go to work. Yeah, stay home. Right. It's yeah. this phenomenon that it's referred to as presenteeism. When I take public transportation here in the city, you know, you have to touch uh, rails and doors and so forth. I try and keep my hands away from my eyes and mouth and nose until I've washed them because yeah, there the, are things there that, you know, right. I mean, I'm not paranoid, but you have to be a little sensible. Don't rub your eye after you've touched the subway pole. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, you get the the dreaded subway virus, which is a double-stranded DNA virus. <laughs> it's an icosahedral capsid. Yes. Okay. DSV. Yeah. Sorry, say that. DSV. <laughs> yes. DSV, dreaded subway virus. <laughs> That's a good title, the dreaded subway virus. That up there. <laughs> How about the antibodies? I wonder who wants to crack that. Uh, I don't know of. Uh, I, I think on most times, you're looking for a specific antibody. Yeah. Right. And you have a specific test to look for that antibody. And there are all sorts of uh, tests, um, all sorts of different uh, tests that um, probably all have in common that you. Uh, have an antigen that is a protein or a piece of a protein that you know uh, reacts with the antibody that you're looking for and you fix that antigen to something <clears throat> and then um, uh, treat that surface to which the antibody is stuck uh, or to, the, to which the antigen is stuck with uh, serum from... Uh, the person you think might contain the antibody. And uh, if the antibody is there, it'll stick to the antigen. So now you've got it stuck to a surface. And then usually what happens is you come in with a second antibody that is uh, reactive in general with antibodies and has some sort of fluorescent tag to it uh, so that you can, it'll, if there's antibody there, it'll grab onto that and leave uh, a fluorescent tag on the on the surface. So, you know, what I've really just described is something called an ELISA, where you stick the antigen to plastic and then react it with serum and then a secondary labeled antibody. But there's also a lot of tests with like, um, uh, um, yeah, well, actually, this is, di this is different. So I was thinking of uh, immunofluorescence. If you want to see whether somebody's got a virus, that's different. You're looking for antigen right. where you get cells out of somebody and, and react them with a, a pre-prepared antibody. I don't know. I don't know enough about this, but I don't know of testing methods that are sort of global. What antibodies do you have? That's, yeah. I mean, because you got yeah. a gazillion of them to start with, right? Right. There, and, there are... Um Kind of two questions here. In a he he asked, does the researcher look for a specific antibody? Um, <clears throat> if it's if it's in a clinical setting, a physician will order a test for a particular antibody. Right. So if you go and you get tested for hepatitis B or hepatitis C, um, well, your doctor would say, okay. <clears throat> Go next door. They're going to draw your blood and they'll do this test. And the test would be. Um, taking hepatitis B virus antigens and exposing your serum to them and seeing if you have antibodies against that virus capsid or core, um, depending on whether you've been vaccinated or infected. Um, so that's, that's done for looking for a specific antibody against a specific uh, agent. The other situation that I can think of where this comes up is if somebody... Um, dies of some mysterious illness in the United States, often the CDC will get a call if it's a sufficiently mysterious illness. Um, and they may, um, they or a state health department may do a test that's broader based. So they have um, tests that are, for example, for a bunch of different influenza strains or um, you know, a bunch of different antigens from a bunch of different viruses. And they can delve fairly far into that problem and say, oh, hey, you know, this person is reacting, this person's antibodies react partially to, um, to hantavirus. Uh, what does that mean? And then they could go, and this is how the virus hunting is done by public health officials when they're investigating a novel outbreak. So that's a little more like displaying the antibodies found in a sample, but it's still... It's really just a series of specific tests. You still have a hypothesis. You still have a hypothesis, it and, and it's, still, um, it's still specific antigens in each well right. that you're looking at. And you say, okay, we tested 300 different antigens, and they reacted to A4 and D9, um, and those correspond to something. 
Um, but there's no, I'm not aware of any test that would just fractionate all the antibodies. I'm not even sure you could do that and try and characterize. You, you, you need an antigen to determine what the antibody binds to. All right. Uh, Rich, would you take the next one, please? Ricardo writes, Hello, TWIV members. Thank you for TWIV 171, all of it, especially the last part. Which was that? This one uh, with uh, Kathy Spindler and uh, myself. Um, one is the loneliest number. Right. Okay. We truly learn a lot of virology from this show, but from a long time now, I have noticed some other things we can learn, especially students, as there are so many, I bet. Enthusiasm for what you do, even if it is science, an enormous desire for knowledge and the ways of getting it, uh, getting it in a proper fashion. This afternoon, we learned that it is possible that you can make a mistake it is okay to be told about it, and mainly, it is okay to face it and accept the criticism. I'm proud to recommend TWIV. Please keep up the good work because you guys are doing it fine. What did we screw up? I don't remember. It may have been a letter from someone. Okay. Or, but we always accept uh, corrections oh, yeah. very nicely. Well, I'll tell you, that's probably one of the most important lessons we could prob uh, we could teach anybody. Yeah. Yes. Is that when you make a mistake, you recognize it, you correct it, and... You know, say, hey, I screwed up. Yeah. Yes. Ricardo is our friend in Portugal. And it's better to not know than to think that you do and not know. <laughs> right. <laughs> is that what uh, the Secretary of Defense said once? Oh, no. The, yeah, right. That's, <laughs> there, there were too many unknown knowns there, I think. <laughs> Next one is from Sven, who writes, Dear Twiv Team... I really enjoy your podcast, podcasts, I should say, including TWIM. I have been thinking about going back to academia for a while now after I've worked for five years in biotech. Your podcast helped my decision-making significantly since I realized that I want to do more hands-on research. I'm a trained molecular virologist with over 10 peer-reviewed papers, and he gives us a little PubMed search for his work, and several years of BSL-4 experience. I published the first successful rescue of a recombinant Marburg virus from cDNA a few years ago. My dream is to get an academic position at the University of Hawaii since my interest has always been emerging infectious diseases, and I am sure that my experience could help the Pacific Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases research, especially with the new BSL-3. I've been out of academia for five years, but I hope that this is not too long to step back into academia. Do you have any suggestions for me that could help me in my endeavors? Many thanks and best wishes from Maryland. I'd say you should go see uh, Matt Freeman and work in his lab and get some papers. There and, you go. And then good you know, idea. Go, uh, because I think you need to get back into the basic research shtick, right? Right. You need to jump into a lab. Yeah, because probably in your past year, a few years in biotech, you haven't published basic stuff which would help you get a job so you got to get into a lab and, also listen uh, to twiv 184 and decide whether you really want to go back and back <laughs> <laughs> oh dear no just saying <laughs> just saying right you know he got in, he got excited by twiv now and now we don't want to yeah it's no, tough no, it's tough it. but i think you could get your foot back in the door uh somewhere and, and find a job even if it's uh, not as high up as you'd like right that may be what uh, experience in uh, high containment facilities uh, is a, a a saleable skill. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, a good experience with BSL three or even better. You know, he says he's got several years, several of, BSL years of BSL four experience. BSL4. That's a marketable skill. Yeah, You're, the number of places you can work is limited, but they but they do hire people and they're probably going to need more in the near future because we've been building more of these things. So I, I don't think you should expect to get a tenure track position immediately, but you can get a research associate type position, a non tenure track position, you know, build up a portfolio and then go from there. That's what right. that I would do or try anyway. Okay. Uh, Alan. Uh, John writes, I enjoy your podcasts and always learn a lot. The problem is, though, um, that I rarely have enough time to listen to your typical hour and 20 to hour and 40 minute program. I respectfully request that you work to reduce program length to one hour. 
Maybe you could consider shortening the introductory and ending discussions and have less chit-chat in the middle. By so the way... I, I think we should take a few minutes to talk about this. Lesson. Yeah. By the way... <laughs> How's the weather? You know, yeah, I, you, you never asked me. It's 85 degrees That's here. That's right. I, I did. <laughs> Why? It's because I asked and you before it's most, we started. It's mostly cloudy. Actually, the temperature went up since we, you know, since you we have, were talking get, before the show. Do you have to get your grass mowed before it rains, or does grass grow there? Actually, you know, uh, the uh, th I was out of town this week, and the lawn guy mowed my grass for me, which was the lawn you know, guy. You have a lawn guy. Well, it, we have a we have a guy, a yard guy, but I mow the lawn because if I don't mow the lawn, he spends all of his time mowing the lawn. Oh, I, I can get it, mow I get the lawn. Okay. okay. That's nice. I don't have a yard guy anymore. I have to do everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm the yard guy here. I got a couple of trees I have to take down this weekend. They're just little dogwoods. Uh, but the hard part is the root. You got any advice about that? The stump. Oh, call call a stump grinding service. Yeah, absolutely. None of those That's potions the they sell at the hardware store is, are going to work, and digging up the stump oh. is is going to take you days. And just, just oh. call one of these stump grinding places. They bring a little... Uh, tractor thing in, and it makes a heck of a lot of noise for about twenty minutes, and the stump's gone. <laughs> Not only that, but you got to stay home and watch them do this because the stump grinder is a great machine. Yes, that's a specialized profession, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had I, I know all about tree removal and stump removal since our our tree apocalypse around here. Tree apocalypse. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, where were so, we? I forgot. So you suppose uh, well, we I, responded John, John, to John's uh, email? Yeah, John, John, I hope that answers your email. <laughs> All right. Um, Jim, uh, sorry. And seriously, no, no, seriously. <laughs> we, shouldn't, we shouldn't just do that. Uh, seriously, though, John, um, they, there are a couple of ways you can approach that. You could either uh, split it up, you know, listen to it. I, I, we've gotten letters from a lot of people who, who listen to it over a period of a week-long commute, you know, each way. Um, and uh, there's uh, there's one guy, in fact, I think it may be our next letter writer, right, who listens to it at double speed. That's right, Jim does, yeah. Yeah, he's commented uh, several times. You can, you can do that, and in fact, that's a built-in feature now on... Um, uh, I know iPhones and I think Android devices do this too. You can just just you know bump yeah. it up, do two x, three x. So just uh, just speed us up or split the uh, episode up, and and you'll be fine. I I never listen to an episode in one go. Yeah, almost always, never. Yeah, always yeah. No, I, sure. I'm always pausing them. But to be honest, John, many people like the chit chat because it. It makes us personal and not just right. you know scientists and yeah. And if we shortened the show and tried to you know keep clipping along, it would be a different podcast. It would be more yeah. of a you know a news type podcast, which there are already plenty of. Over on Twip, we had a letter of someone saying you know stop fooling around with Dixon, and I read it and I said yeah you're right I'm sorry I fool around too much. <laughs> and then we got a slew of ones that said no don't stop we love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I really like the way the uh, we actually got around to stump grinding <laughs> yes. on, on that one. That was good. Well, I needed I need to get these out. You know, <laughs> now, now you know because you know there's nothing worse than having a stump than you have to mow around the stump. The whole point That's of getting rid of the trees is that you don't have to mow around the tree. They run the stump grinder with a little remote control. Yes. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's <laughs> terrific. I it. see it. It's wonderful. Well, it's like the dentist with the X-ray machine. So. Yeah. yeah. All right, Rich, you are next. Jim writes, I see discussions about the Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics Initiative. That's the STEM initiative, but no mention of biosciences. Is there a similar initiative underway? Bioscience developments are certainly appearing at every turn, so a need for more help must exist. I've always assumed that STEM included uh Bioscience. Yeah, I think the science it part does. It emphatically right? does. Yeah. Every every yeah. time policymakers and have been to meetings about this, and um, this is uh, bioscience is one of the core things that they're always bringing up because of all of this in biotechnology. We need our our kids to be ready for it, um, and so yeah, it's absolutely under that science heading. Um, you'll notice there aren't any specific chemical science initiatives or uh, physical science initiatives. It's all it's all that um, technology, engineering, mathematics got brought in there because it's not always included under the science heading, although it should be. Mm. Yeah. 
All right, the next one is from Sergio, who writes, Dear Twivimpers, T-W-I-V, Empers. Good, all three podcasts. It has been a long while since I decided I wanted to write you again, so I ask for your apologies if the ideas on this mail fall all over the place. When I discovered Twiv, I was still a naive, innocent master student in Japan. I was hooked immediately. Kudos to Vince's son and the gaming chapter. Wow, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. Wow. Many years later, also a new iPod, one daughter, a baby soon to come, an earthquake, a tsunami, and a nuclear accident later. (laughs) Wow. I came back to my country, Bolivia, a year ago with a PhD, a family to look for, and many dreams. Needless to say, very little money. Other than that, how was Japan? (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm still looking for a stable job. PhDs are not in a high demand in developing countries, but I try to keep up with TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP. Sorry to say that being used to a super fast connection in Japan, and now it seems it takes ages to download each episode. But I keep waiting every one of them, although now I am sort of behind in all three podcasts. I have that problem in western Massachusetts, too. <laughs> well, I am an agronomist. I bet now Vince knows what that means after being in Brazil. And I specialized in plant pathogens in general. Therefore, I find all of your podcasts fascinating. My doctoral dissertation was about a bacterial plant pathogen, Ralstonia solanaceum, solanaceum. Solanaceum? Yeah. And it's survival that in water and soil. So I guess you could say I am sort of a plant epidemiology slash microbial ecology guy. Nevertheless, virology still is fascinating to me, plant viruses, obviously, and I learned a lot about parasites as well. Nematodes are very important plant pathogens. By the way, where is Dixon lately? <laughs> <laughs> Darn fine question. He's not here today. He went fishing. Of course. That also explains why I am a little biased in preferring stories about bacteria and fungi. I have previous I have written to you previously wanting to know about dengue fever. I hope I am not suffering that right now. Fever, malaise, runny nose, etc. Welcome to the tropics. About gene silencing in plants and funding. I am the guy who put Rich Condit in the spot asking for suggestions on how to get funded. Sorry about that. I love this is a stream of consciousness. Yeah, I love this, is, this is good. Since I do not yet have yet I'm always optimistic, a fixed job. I have been doing consulting jobs, awkwardly enough, for university projects in biological control and plant pathology. The last of those little jobs brought me to the middle of the Bolivian subtropic, where I'm eight hours away from the city, my hometown La Paz, through the most dangerous road of the world. I am not making this up. Check this. He sends a YouTube video of this. They call it the Death Road. Did you watch this video? Yeah. I did. I did. <laughs> oh, wow. And I get to teach tropical agronomy students about plant disease integrated management. It has been one of the most rewarding experiences in my life because thanks to internet and open access, in which, of course, the Twivmp Media Empire is included, I am able to give to farmer kids who have never had access to the latest knowledge sources the best information I can. Of course, they have deficiencies. The education system is very bad, as you can imagine. But I can see there is potential if these students get the opportunity to get a better education. All right, so then he has a weekly pick, which we will save uh, till later. Um, And he also mentions another podcast, uh, which I can mention now because it's not a pick, uh, El Mundo de los Microbios, which is the podcast in Spanish of ASM, conducted by another Bolivian, go figure. There they touch human microbiology, but have also dealt with plant pathogens sometimes. Finally, as I always do, I would like to suggest some more episodes on plant viruses in TWIV and plant parasitic nematodes in TWIP. I hope this long mail didn't exceed your patience due to its length. Once again, thanks for your great podcast. Keep them coming. We will keep listening. Sergio. The funny thing is that... um, there's a visiting student in the lab now this summer, and he is from Puerto Rico. So the first thing I said is, do you listen to Mundo de los Microbios of Gary Taranzo? He said, yeah, yeah I had the professor for my microbiology class. Oh, good. It was small cool. world. Anyway, thanks for the email, Sergio, and thanks for listening. I Sergio love- uh, describes, a, you know, communicates a real passion for his uh, for his work and for science. Yeah. And you know, if you combine that with some energy and just show up, something will happen. You know, 
um, he'll he'll make himself indispensable. So keep keep at it. Sir he will. Drew. He's yeah. definitely not um, discouraged, right? That's great. Nope. All right, Alan. Gopal writes, uh, Hello, I wonder if anyone has drawn your attention to this article published in the British newspaper, The Guardian. Um, and uh, he links to an article. Uh, the remarks of Dr. Jeremy Farrar, a specialist who's been seeing serious cases of avian H5N1 infections for many years now in Vietnam, are, I thought, particularly noteworthy. Uh, doctor is quoting uh, Farrar now. Uh, the genetic mutations that made Fouchier and Kawaoka's viruses so transmissible in ferrets would not necessarily be the same ones that helped bird flu jump into humans. But if the details were published, Farrar said that he could at least screen for them and learn whether the mutations appear only singularly in the wild or start appearing in clusters of twos, threes, and fours. More importantly, knowing how the mutations transform the virus would help scientists spot other mutations that could make bird flu adapt to humans. Quote, all of this surveillance is not much, uh, not much value if the experimental work, which is mostly done, done in Western labs, is not made available to the countries where it's most needed. We can't be blinkered into thinking these are the only mutations that matter, but the information could be important for us, Farrar said. People dying of H5N1 infections in Asia and places like Egypt, not, not in Europe, uh, people are dying uh, of H5N1 infections in Asia and places like Egypt, not in Europe or America. If the H5N1 virus was killing people in America, would this crazy debate created by the NSABB ever have taken place? I doubt it, uh, says Gopal. Good point. Yeah. And I think that's a major reason that the um, uh, the WHO meeting, which was international in scope, mm -hmm. um, had a very different outcome from the NSABB conference calls. Um, not only in being an in-person meeting rather than an electronic one, but also in having representation from places that are severely affected by this virus. I think we touched on this a bit, and you know, this was uh, this kind of use of the information for surveillance. You, you don't know how useful it is because, as he says, it's ferrets, right? And right. And if you and uh, Arturo Castaval said to me. Once, if you did the experiment again, you might get totally different mutations. So, yeah. yeah, this is true too. But nevertheless, you should spread the data. And uh, sure. And, and I think when we talked about the Kawaoka paper, um, we even with Mike Imperiali on the show, we even talked about that. Uh, that it's not the specific mutations yeah. that are really the important finding here. It's that you need them in two different parts of the molecule, and uh, and that they're compensatory. You know, this all is going to happen in just little increments. Right, mutation here, mutation there. If right. something shows up in nature, something shows up in the lab, it's going to take years for all of this stuff to make sense. But every little bit is important. Yeah, and then by by then we'll have a universal flu vaccine. So that'd yes. be good. That'd be an issue. Which all the major vaccine manufacturers are currently working on. Um, I heard the Fouché paper will be out at the end of June, June twenty something. Oh, great. Well, so let us know, Alan, when it's going to come out of uh, embargo. Yeah, and we'll, yeah, I'll, I'll we'll talk about probably it. get a heads up on it. Uh, Rich, Stephanie writes, "Dear Twiv Crew, I noticed an editorial in the March 29th, 2012 edition of Nature, asserting that the low success rate of clinical trials based on preclinical data was due to the sloppiness of the scientists." Isn't it a bit strange for someone to assume that effective treatments in animal models should necessarily work in humans? Shouldn't the severe limitations imposed on clinical trials by both cost and patient number be considered here? What do you guys think of this accusation? And I looked up these editorials. There's both an editorial and a comment uh, that are both very, very good. And um, actually... This is very reminiscent of what we just talked about on, what was it, TWIV 184, uh, which was, uh, you know, the problems with the way science is mm -hmm. done nowadays. Mm -hmm. right. That is the competition, the pressure to publish, the pressure to, you know, make a name for yourself uh, generates sloppy science. Now, Stephanie's got a point here. Um, uh Effective treatments in animal models don't necessarily work in humans. That's why you have to do human trials. People understand that. Limitations imposed by human trials, trials by both cost and patient number should be considered. Yeah, before you're going to launch a human trial, you better make sure that the preclinical data is uh, the preclinical data are okay. But what these, what the 
editorial and in particular the comment point out the comments written by somebody who uh, I think they actually themselves uh, took something like 50 different uh, preclinical uh, experiments and tried to reproduce them and only six of them were reproducible okay so the message here is that there is a lot of slop being published uh, because people uh, want to you know are under pressure uh, to to make progress, but I agree with Stephanie from the point of view. If I were going to launch a clinical trial, which is hugely expensive, I'd I'd want to make sure that the preclinical data were that I was basing it on were reproducible. As a matter of fact, if I learned anything in doing my PhD, it's that you probably ought to try and repeat whatever experiment is that your experiment is based on. Well, also the most of the preclinical data is in animals, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. There are some times by when, definition. by definition, some times when a vaccine or a drug will work in an animal and it fails in people. That yeah. is absolute. That's why you have to test them in people. That's why you can't extrapolate from animal models. There are there are and monkeys exaggerate, right? Exactly. Yeah. There. I think there are two. To me, I see these as two separate issues. Um, yeah. Yeah. They they interact, but. Um, on the one hand, there's there is a lot of sloppiness in the literature. That's true. Uh, it is something we talked about on Twiv 184: the pressure to publish, the increasing number of of kind of journals bordering on spam at this point. Um, so there's all that going on, which is a general problem in science that we need to address. Um, but in getting from preclinical to clinical data, the to to me. <clears throat> The big problem, the really huge problem, is that our animal models <clears throat> kind of suck. Um, and and you know I've been to meetings that have discussed this issue extensively, and and people try to come up with better systems. You know, you you get a cell based system, and you can you can get a lot of mechanistic insight from that, but ultimately it's still a cell based system. Uh, and some people are hoping that um, induced pluripotent stem cells, you can grow now tissues and, and even um, uh, <clears throat> at least parts of organs. Um, so there's a lot of hope being put into that, that you could do tests of a heart medication on a, on a human heart that you grew in the lab. Um, that's a great idea, but it's still really kind of in beta. Um, so... It, the the thing with laboratory animal systems is it's it's kind of like I think somebody commented once that uh, democracy is the worst possible governmental system except for all other possible governmental systems. Mm-hmm. Right. So animal models are just the worst possible way to get useful information about human biology except for all the other systems we have. Right. Um, so nobody nobody likes the the procedure here or or the way the the low quality of the results we're getting, but it's just the nature of the beast at this point. Didn't we once discuss this New Yorker article about irreproducibility of, of yeah. science? Mm-hmm. I think we yes. did, right? It's another, it's also part of this whole issue. As well. Yeah, and it affects different fields to different degrees, as I think yeah. we said with the New Yorker article. It, it, the thing is, if you're looking for some small size effect it's going to be highly susceptible to all sorts of, of problems that are going to affect reproducibility. Right. That's why I always preferred to look at things that were, you know, three or four logs difference from experiment to control. Yeah, yeah we don't like to have to use statistics. <laughs> no, if you, if you have to use statistics, something went horribly wrong. <laughs> all right, the next one's from Howard. Hi, Twivs. First, congratulations to me on receiving the Peter Wilde Award. Certainly a well-deserved honor. Thank you. Oh. Next two, you guys know that? Yeah. Okay. That was the Dublin thing, yeah, right? Yeah, the Dublin thing. Oh, okay, right. Next, two letters on TWIV 176 strongly resonated with parts of my experience. The letter from the graduate student who was upset at the lack of professional respect shown when a presumed colleague appropriated her intellectual property reminded me of a similar incident when I was a graduate student in medical microbiology. In my case, the trusted individual Xeroxed my master's thesis and subsequently got a position at a prestigious research lab working on the same microorganism at Harvard University. He repeated and confirmed my unpublished work and published it without attribution. The upside is that the results helped initiate a couple of research products projects by the PIs in his lab, and their scientific ability and intellectual prowess resulted in discoveries in areas I might not have investigated. 
It is satisfying to be part of the process, even if unacknowledged. You're very generous there, Howard. Yep. The next letter about the possible Epstein-Barr virus etiology of chronic fatigue syndrome also hit close to home. Some years ago, my wife and one son were exposed to a diagnosed severe case of infectious mononucleosis. They both developed typical symptoms, with my wife's being a bit more severe, although her physician was skeptical that she also had mono because she was almost 40 years old and would be presumed to have contracted it as a young adult, like our son had. I requested a more complete lab workup and discovered she had a high titer of anti-EBV antibodies of the IgM class indicating a recent first infection. Her symptoms then progressed over the next several weeks into what we later discovered were typical CFS symptoms. Working with her physician, we ruled out other possible diagnoses and an immunological workup at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh oh, sorry, showed a CD8 po- positive T cell response that was typical for chronic EBV infections and which is associated with CFS. She gradually improved, but over the years she has had flare ups with inflamed lymph nodes and nodules under skin and ear- near muscles, generalized pains, and extreme fatigue, but symptomatic treatment allows her to bounce back. My suspicion is that having a severe EBV infection as an adult rather than as a youngster or a young adult, may lead in some cases to the chronic condition diagnosed as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Maybe this is analogous to having an initial infection with poliovirus or mumps or measles virus as an adult where the infection and sequelae are more severe. However, none of the above precludes the involvement of another agent, infectious agent, being required for the observed outcome. And finally, thank you and your crew for educational and entertaining TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP series. They are good for my brain and the rest of my body, too, because I often listen to them while working out and have extended my time doing aerobic exercise so as not to finish before the end of the podcast. Another example of the TWIV bump, I guess. Yes. And, and uh, another reason why we shouldn't shorten the show. <laughs> people, we need people to stay healthy. It's a very good description of the EBV business here. I like mm-hmm. that. And his yes. acknowledgement that there may be other things as well. Right. Yeah, and, and also that there are undoubtedly people who've been put into one diagnosis who might really have something else. Yeah, that's what makes uh, uh, <clears throat> that's what this makes me think of, is that a lot of stuff that... As you have said, uh, Alan, CFS is really a, a diagnosis of exclusion, right? Right. And a lot of stuff that uh, winds up getting labeled as CFS may, in fact, you know, uh, have some other etiology. Not that we know that what the etiology is. CFS may incorporate a lot of things. Yeah, and there are gonna there. I'm sure there are people in that category who have diagnosable other diseases, right? But they just the, their doctors have didn't it. catch what they right. actually have, and they ended up. Uh, diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and you know there they are, right? Um, it, and that's what all this discussion about case definition tries to address. But I don't think anybody's come up with a satisfactory, uh, really clear set of distinctions on that. Uh, Boy, the uh, whole XMRV thing sure went away, didn't it? Uh, we, you know, we're <laughs> still waiting for. We're still waiting for um, uh, what Ian's. Yes. Result. Yes. Right. Well, it's gone away, but there are still people interested in it. There are still <laughs> people who are very uh, yeah. intense about that. If you if you look at my latest blog post, uh, Rich, okay. there's quite a bit of commenting activity there. Yeah. All right. But it's a it's a small number of people who believe fervently in yeah in this. So. Alan, you are next. Okay, Peter writes, Dear TWIV team, the research looks interesting. Uh, This research looks interesting. A variation in a single gene, IFITM3, can make influenza life threatening for some people and a relatively mild disease in others. Particularly interesting to me, as I've always been prone to respiratory infections, and they seem to persist for longer than in most people. Uh, The protective mechanism is not yet known, but if a test is produced to show who has the less effective form of the gene, then they could be given preferential vaccinations. And he links to a um, press release about um, this paper that I think we talked about a little while ago, We did do that, yep. 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 That was TWIV 180. Yeah, the thing is that even if you know you have this mutation in this gene, it's not 100% penetrant. In other words, just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to be susceptible. So, you know, the general value of these um, whole genome-wide associations is still not clear. Yeah. 
And uh, this is this, by the way, Peter probably wrote this letter before Tweet oh, 180. Yes, yes. So we're, so we're very backlogged. In this, <laughs> but hopefully it's, Peter listened and enjoyed it. In other words, discussion. it's a great idea for an episode. Uh, you know, there was something about this paper that uh, I noticed uh, afterwards, uh, if I've got the numbers right here. Because the thrust of this paper was that, or the big result of this paper, among other things, was that this mutation that uh, uh, alters susceptibility uh, to, what was it? Flu. Sorry. Severe flu. flu. Yeah. Uh, showed up in the normal population at uh, 0.3%. Mm-hmm. And in the people hospitalized with severe influenza at 5.7%, right? Right. So that was a big difference. But there were, of the hospitalized pay, uh, people, we're talking about, I think, 53 patients. And right. 5.7% of 53 is like two or three people. Right, right. So I want to I, I, I see a larger sample size. Sure. I mean, it's great, but I want to see a larger sample size. No, no. I mean, the other people with... Uh Severe flu didn't have this mutation, so right. it's something else. It's not just one thing, but it's yeah. a start. I, I yeah. think it's cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rich, you're next. Uh, where am I? Neva. Ah, okay, Neva. I think this is a Neva again. Yeah. We did a Neva before. Dear Twivers all. This is your note says save for later. Uh, oh, that, yeah, she's got a pick of the week here, so let's. All right, that, so yeah. we'll put that down at the bottom. Uh, here we go. And this has been going back and forth. And this is of uh, significant <laughs> interest to me since my daughter lives very near this town. A note on the pronunciation of Buda, Texas, where Neva lives. Uh, the name origin story locally is that the town was named after a boarding house slash eating establishment on the railroad stop run by two widows. The Spanish word for widow is Viuda. So the name became Buda, pronounced Buda. Most folks here about are pretty laid back. So if you say Buddha, what the heck? <laughs> Love your podcast, Neva. Yeah, because somebody else, it first came up and I said, ah, I know how that's pronounced. It's Buda, not Buddha. And then somebody wrote in and said, no, 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 no. It's Buddha. Well, Neva, who lives there, says it's Buddha. And this is because originally your daughter is near there. It came up in some uh, other way, didn't it? Uh, well, somebody wrote. Somebody from Buda wrote in. Maybe it was I made Neva. Big, Maybe it was Neva. Could it, yeah, it could have been Neva. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, we're big in Buda. I guess that's either right, that or it's just Neva. But Neva may be ten uh, percent of the population in Buda. Like Buda is not a big town. We're big in. Buda. That's a good title. B U D A. It's good. That's a good one. All right. Thank you. It's a beautiful little town, though. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, the next one is from Gambier, G A M B H I R. Dear Professor Rack and Yellow and the Dear Old Gang, which can be abbreviated as Dog. <laughs> uh, I'm a big Twiv fan and have listened a lot over the past few years. First, Walking to and from work at Imperial College of London, the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, where it and TWIP have really helped me to learn about virology, parasites, and biology. My background is in physics and math, and I've had to retrain as a biologist, albeit a mathematical biologist. Your chat with Alan Dixon, Richard, and now Michael is terrific fun and very informative. My latest position is in Atlanta, where I have moved with my wife at CDC. I've been trying to put together projects and people for an infectious disease mathematical modeling unit. And so far, I'm working my proverbial butt off on several projects concerning viral and bacterial infections, but it's enormously exciting and challenging. Regarding episode 173, Michael Walsh's last appearance. Michael was talking about issues relating to the kind of work I have been trying to kickstart at CDC, and I would enormously welcome such a chat. Please let Michael know and take him up on it. Keep up the great work. Your listenership seems rightly devoted and delights in every show. Thank you, Manoj. Wait a minute. Why did I say, oh, Gambier is the last name, so I should have written Manoj, M-A-N-O-J, right? Is that how you yep. would say it? I don't know how you would say that. Manoj, Manoj. 
N O Buda. 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 <laughs> Sorry, Manoy. Alan. Robin writes, when an entity is not metabolically active, it is not at that time alive. This is the, uh, I'm sure this is the viruses are alive <laughs> yeah. question. It is living in the context of appropriate time and ecological frames. A mammoth-specific virus recovered from permafrost would be neither alive nor, in this age, living. It could be revived if a mammoth was successfully cloned. A virus particle is not alive. In itself, it is not living any more than a human being would be living outside the ecosystem that sustains the human. A human without a spacesuit on the moon would not be alive or living. <laughs> Abstracted as an individual entity, a virus particle is no more alive than a frozen bacterium. Living can be a verb, unlike alive. Okay. That's sure. An interesting take, huh? Yeah. Everyone has their own verb, and I like the way it comes up from time to time, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, she makes the, she makes the, uh, is this she? Uh, yes, Robin. Well, could be he could or be she. He. Right. Uh, makes the point that uh, living has to be considered in the context of appropriate time and ecological frames. I like yes. that. Yes, that's very good. It's a very holistic uh, view of the thing. Right. I like that. Uh, Rich. Allison writes, Vincent, I won't lie. I've taken a long hiatus from listening to your podcast. Ah, well, forget it then. We're not going to read the rest of this. <laughs> I blame it on a bad experience with a few virologists, and consequently you and my passion for virology were casualties. Holy cow, this must have been a really bad experience. At the time, I was taking a virology class, and I found a few of the organizing faculty were rather snotty towards my non-virology background slash research. The experience ended badly, and I took it as a clear indication that my path was set away from virology. So, now a couple of years later, I have defended my PhD, yay, and in my pursuit of a postdoc in the area of research I am interested in, I am once again thinking about virology. But the question remains as to whether a switch is even feasible. Do you have an advice for obtaining a postdoc in virology if you are coming from a non-virology field? Thanks, Allison. I don't think we can even deal with this person. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just go there. Right, go right people, it. right people. Yeah, just go do it. I, I, there, there are no barriers. No, right? I, I, I have taken people who don't have virology backgrounds. And I think it's good. I mean, all, all you want is a good scientist to work in your lab. It doesn't matter really what you've done. So I would suggest you identify places and, and areas you want to work in and just email the people. And, I'll yeah, send and them remember, you. the virologists who, who you had a bad experience with are not you know, necessarily typical of the breed. Right. Um, that's just you can, you can have jerks in any field. Uh, yeah, that um, is a, a, an important caution, however, that I think we've talked about before, and that is in choosing a lab and choosing a mentor, the personalities are as important as anything else. And so you've yes. got to find a place where, where you fit. I, I want to uh, remind everybody that, you know, the original virologist, Max Delbrook, was a physicist. Right, he was a the right. theoretical physicist, yeah, yeah. and Wally Gilbert, while he's not—I uh, love this story. Wally Gilbert, while he was not a, um, a virologist necessarily, was uh, uh, this is as in Maxim and Gilbert for those who were not tuned into this, um, a, a Nobel Prize-winning molecular biologist of very significant repute, um, was hired at Harvard as a theoretical physicist. Uh, at the time, my mentor was a graduate student and uh, she had tacked over her uh, desk a one of these big charts that was a metabolic chart had all the pathways on it and uh, Wally apparently became fascinated by the work that was going on in Watts's lab and Joan said that she could tell when Wally had been in the lab at night studying this chart because there were footprints and cigar ashes on her desk. <laughs> 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 He'd be standing on his standing on her desk smoking his cigar studying his chart. Nice. That's excellent. Nice. And and yeah, people change you know, from one area of biology to another, that shouldn't be. And depending on what you did your PhD in, uh, it could actually be a, a very easy transition. I mean, if you did structural biology and you're working in a structural lab that happens to work on viruses, that's not really, um, that's not a big transition. 
Um, I guess it might be bigger if you were an, an ecologist and you, you decided to work in molecular virology. But you know, if you're thinking in this direction, you can probably make it happen. Mm, yeah, I, I don't don't worry at all. Just go for it. Yeah, no. Virology is easy, right? I should have kept should have <laughs> kept deal. listening to Twiv. We would have gotten your spirits up, you know. Because yeah, we we, uh, we talk about coffee coffee yeah, makers. You should have you should have written to us and complained about these guys earlier. Yeah. Yes. Right. We could give them the big collective raspberry and move on. <laughs> yes. Alan, I'm watching the clock. You want to go, or do you want to uh, do your pick now? Uh, I'll go ahead and do my pick. Okay. So, scrolling all the way to the end here, boy, we have a lot of letters stacked <laughs> up, don't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So, my pick of the week is the Worldwide Lightning Location Network. Um, and this is uh, its a topic I'm kind of interested in because I'm into uh, doing odd things on radio frequencies. And lightning has a big impact, puts a lot of static on the, uh, on the radio. Um, so, you, you know, you hear, if you tune around between radio stations on your, your regular dial, mm -hmm. uh, if, for those of you who remember radio, um, <laughs> it, uh, there, there's this kind of staticky <laughs> noise. Uh, and a lot of that is actually lightning strikes mm -hmm. from around the world. Um, this site is really, really cool. They have a series of, um, of locations all scattered all over the, the world. Most of them are at universities. Um, that use uh, low-frequency radio sensors to detect lightning strikes, and they triangulate between them, and they map them. And so you can watch the entire world's lightning activity um, in not quite real time, but pretty close to it. Wow. Um, and it's superimposed over over weather satellites, and you can do... there. There's all sorts of stuff here. There's a... Um, there's an atlas of uh, of lightning uh, strikes over a period of a year. You can look at uh, what areas get them. It's this big band of strikes in the tropics. But it, I, I just find this really interesting. That's cool. I've never seen this before. Yeah. Does lightning also affect uh, internet, like Skype and that sort of thing, data communication? Well, it shouldn't. But if it's traveling over the airwaves, it certainly could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So sometimes the internet does go. Uh, yeah, so wireless wireless yeah. connections, but the um, microwave. Most, yeah. Right. Most of the wireless connections are at high enough frequencies that they're not really affected by this. It was, it's when I you see. go down into the lower bands um, that you really get more and more trouble with lightning. Cool. So. Well, thank you for that, Alan. Very cool. Quite welcome. Thanks for being here. Alan is at alandove.com, of course, and. Yep. Uh, We'll see you next uh, next time. I think in two weeks you'll be back because yes. this uh, week you won't be with us. That's right. All right. Well, enjoy. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Uh, Rich, you want to do a couple more emails? Sure. Take the next one, please. I got to find out where we were. Um, oh, you read Allison, didn't you, just now? Uh, yeah, let me see. Robin Allison, right. You read it. Okay, so I'll take yes. David, dear Twiv, and Twiv168. Vincent's pick of the week was a blog post about the use of technology in the classroom. I've tried all kinds of technology in teaching and allow my students to use laptops and iPads in class. The most frequent comment I get, however, is that the use of one specific technology is most helpful. The oldest technology available in every classroom, the blackboard. Perhaps they assume that if I'm writing it on the blackboard, it must be important and noteworthy. I don't use the blackboard anymore. Uh, I've seen classrooms that don't have blackboards anymore. Yeah, but so many people still do, but I don't. I, th I can understand, though, that, <laughs> that would be Well, the one nice thing about the blackboard is that it makes you slow down. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the, one of the problems with PowerPoint uh, and all of these other yeah, yeah, media sure. things is that you can put too much information in them. Yeah, but I do love the pictures you can show, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, I mean, you can't the, the the stuff that we try and communicate now could not be done with a blackboard alone. I mean, how are you yeah, gonna sure. how are you gonna show a structure? Actually, speaking of Wally Gilbert again, when I was a graduate student, he was the uh, he's he worked out a lot of the molecular details of the lac operon. He came and gave a seminar, and um, he had no slides, which even at that time. Uh, was revolutionary. Uh, I mean, slides weren't revolutionary, but not using them mm -hmm. was yeah. was radical. 
and he just carried around colored chalk with him, and he had the whole LAC operator sequence. It's only 40 nucleotides, but nevertheless, he had the whole thing in his head and uh, gave his whole seminar just with colored chalk and a blackboard. It was terrific. When I was a student here in the city, uh, the Rockefeller used to have a, a seminar series at night called the Enzyme Club. Mm -hmm. It was very famous, and they would, they would have outside speakers, and it was open to anyone. And the, the requirement was it was a chalk talk. Right. So even in the 1970s, you know, slides were pretty common by then, regular photographic slides. Mm -hmm. Chalk talk. And right. I remember hearing uh, Peter Duesberg talk about retroviruses and transformation, just chalk. And it makes you do it a certain way. Right. I've been invited to give a uh, cafe science talk here in New York. Oh, that should be fun. Just uh, stand up front and talk. Right. That should be fun. So it makes you do different things, you know. I think that's that's a, that cafe science thing is sort of a that's a kind of a movement is that right? I think I've seen them in all sorts of cities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we ought to look into this. Yeah, it's it's interesting. That'd be interesting to record. Well, let me them, know. Right? Uh, yeah, let me know how that goes. I'll let you know. Uh, David continues also in Twiv one six eight. A listener's email asked about endogenous retroviruses and whether they could be removed. Uh, Welkin mentioned that those sequences now play an important role in the overall architecture of the genome. I'd like to add that to that discussion by mentioning that some of those ancient retroviral integrations are essential in other ways, too. Formation of the placenta depends on expression of proteins called syncytions, which drive the fusion of cells to form the syncytiotrophoblast. Syncytions, or syncytins, appear to be envelope genes of retroviral origin, which, of course, have fusogenic activity. A process critical to the development and evolution of placental mammals thanks to an ancient virus. I wouldn't be surprised to find other important processes that are the result of ancient viral integration. So he sends a, a link to a PNAS paper on this, which I'd seen also uh, not too long ago. A pair of co-opted retroviral envelope syncytin genes is required for formation of the two-layered murine placental syncytioblast. Cool. And Sorry, I'm sure he's... Blast. I'm sure he's right that there's going to be other examples yeah. of this that will pop up. Yeah, this has got to be for sure. David, of course, is a professor at Vassar. Works on pox viruses. Remember David, ah, right? Yeah, David sure. Is David Esteban. I didn't, real, I didn't realize that was our David. It's David. Okay. All right. Right. Tom writes, <clears throat> Dear Vincent, Dick, Rich, Alan, and whoever is your guest today, I wrote to you some weeks ago regarding the... Uh, Ah, uh, the quote, so, unquote, preface to answers, which I think about every time I think about that, uh, that letter. So what? <clears throat> yeah, so, <laughs> and mentioned that my wife's name for whatever variant of CFS she has had was uh, WBD, or weird butt disease. <clears throat> In addition to TWIV, I'm now following along on Vincent's uh, W3, 3310 virology course on iTunes U. This is a wonderful resource and is greatly enriching my understanding of the TWIV conversations. In lecture three, a student asks you if there are viruses that tap into the mitochondrial DNA replication machinery. You responded that you, we, don't know of anybody, uh, don't know of any, but there could be. My first thought was there must be. Mitochondria are often described as symbionts that presumably evolved from some independent life form. Over the course of evolution, it's hard to imagine that, dis, that, di, that distant ancestor staying immune to viruses. If nature provides a resource such as DNA replication, some other aspect of nature will evolve to tap into it. My second thought was to wonder if this could be at least part of what is going on with CFS. From the onset of my wife's illness, the symptomatic description that always fit best was that her mitochondria had a greatly diminished capacity to produce ATP. Some doctors provide symptomatic relief to CFS patients using glutathione supplementation to boost AP, ATP production. Coupling that to patients' frequent accounts of their illness onsetting resembli uh, onset resembling the body's viral defense response, I think this could be something to investigate. It may also explain why, despite symptomatic and epidemiological hints that CFS may be viral, research along those lines has so far failed. Tossing things back in your court as a null hypothesis, how would one go about establishing that 
a mitochondrial virus does not cause CFS. Can you think of a line of research that could probe this question? Keep up the good work. And Alan, your punning is contagious, if not outright viral. <clears throat> well, Do you know of any virus that utilizes mitochondrial DNA replication system? Uh, no, I do not. Yeah, so that's what I told the class. But it's a good question. Uh, it's a great question. And I would also imagine that uh, if there were such a thing, that it could very easily uh, show up as uh, some sort of, you know, cause diseases in whatever uh, creature it um, affected. Uh, I would not go about trying to establish that uh, a mitochondrial virus does not cause CFS. That's trying to prove a negative, and that's a dangerous line of investigation. But, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for trying to find a mitochondrial virus is, well, all the sorts of virus hunting technologies that we've, that we've talked about. Um, but a uh, very interesting question. No, I know, of, I, I know of no evidence that a virus infects mitochondria, but I, I agree that it certainly seems likely. I think that as people look for an infectious cause of CFS, if if one is found, then uh, it it could be mitochondrial. But I wouldn't use that as as you say as the primary no. driver. Just find whatever the infectious right. agent or agents are. Uh, there's a PS, there's a yeah. PS here, Vincent. I apparently missed something you said in your lecture several times. You've presented a slide showing the seven viral genomes based on their respective paths to mRNA. But the labeling circles with Roman numerals only go one through sixth. Where's the seventh genome? All right, so the, um, the seventh is the, the, the gapped double-stranded DNA genome of hepatitis B viruses. And in the original Baltimore scheme, which David Baltimore developed, he had, he had six genome types. And he gave them Roman numerals 1 to 6. So we have that on the figure, and we just add the seventh type. It's in the upper right, but we didn't put a Roman numeral on it just to show that it wasn't in the original scheme. You know what the one of the best representations of uh, this is, is on the um, Viral Zone site. Yeah. They have as a, a matter of fact, I copped their picture for the new edition of TWIV, uh, TWIV new edition of Fields. Yeah. Okay, because they, they they did a really nice job with it, and it, you know, it's basically it's uh, David's system evolved to account for the new genomes that weren't around when he originally did the um, uh, did that. Yeah, categorization. I just used his for historical reasons, but yeah, that probably is a better one. Maybe in our next edition of uh, the textbook. Uh, the next one's from Joe, who writes, I listen to Science 360 Radio, which broadcasts all of your This Week In shows. Love them all. I am especially interested in virology, so I try to play, pay closer attention to that. Any chance you guys give an episode just based on the basics of virus replication? If you've already done that, then apologies. Also, I'm an undergrad biochemistry major, physics minor. I may be involved in some biophysics neuroscience undergrad research since the virus research at my university is very limited and out of my de department, biology department, is protective of their undergrad research spots. Would this cause problems regarding any chance of my getting into a virology program? Any other advice? Thanks a ton. Big fan, Joe. Well, we have done a bunch of virology 101s. And we need to do more. We've let that slide. We have let it slide. We got... 39, 43, 46, 49, 60, 66, 96, and 106. So, Joe, you may just go back and we, we break it up. We don't have any one on the basics of virus replication. We break it up into the different stages. But but, but notice it's been almost 80 episodes since we did one. Oh, this is bad. Let's do one this yeah, summer, this, yeah, all right? Yeah, yeah, a couple. Get back into that. We can That's do a couple, good. all right. And I would say that any undergraduate research you do is fine, and it doesn't, you know, it's not going to... It's it's not going to impact negatively on your wanting to get into virus research. I think the important thing about undergraduate research is to do some, and it doesn't really matter what it is because the the 
characteristics of, of the fundamental characteristics of research that you get out of doing undergraduate research across many, many different disciplines. It's mostly learning how to ask questions, learning that the uh, experiments don't work most of the time, uh, finding out what your reaction to that situation is, whether you find that challenging or frustrating. Because when I interview students who are applying to graduate school, I talk to them about their research, and I'm not looking for specifically what they did. I'm looking to find out uh, sort of what their attitude towards it, whether they understood it, whether they can describe it uh, in a fashion that demonstrates that they understood it, and, um, you know, sort of how they reacted to it. So do whatever you, do whatever you want, and uh, don't worry about whether or not it's specifically related to viruses. Yeah, I agree. Do it, do it well, and be curious. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we talked about earlier, just be aware of everything. You know? mm -hmm. uh, Rich, you are next. Right. Simon writes, "Greetings, Twiv chiefs." First of all, I'd like to offer congratulations to Vincent for receiving the Peter Wildly, uh, wi Widley, Widley, Wildy, Wildly. Okay, Wildy. Actually, it's Wildy. There's no L there at the end. Okay, Wildy. Uh, prize, although it was, of course, only a question of time, in my opinion. Let me pause there and ask you what that prize specifically is given for. <laughs> it's given by the Society for General Microbiology. Uh, for someone who has done things in the area of microbiology education. Okay, cool. So I got it for doing all this stuff that I've Terrific. done. Terrific. And so I went to Terrific. Dublin and uh, gave a little talk as well as did a podcast, which yeah. was cool. I have to say that TWIV is the only podcast, science or otherwise, consistently on my iPhone every week since I started listening to it in, oh my, I think... 2009. Furthermore, this veritable gold mine of free and easy to use knowledge uh, on your web page is just stunning. Please continue just the way you do. I wish we had more people like you and, of course, the rest of the Twiv Ohm. After getting this off my chest, allow me to chirp in on a tangent to your recent episode, 176 All Email, where you mention it would be a good idea to have a cell version of ChronoZoom. I just love the idea. The closest thing I could come up with is, and I hope you didn't mention it this on an earlier show, the Nature Biology online textbook. You can <clears throat> register as a teacher there, and they'll give you free trial access. And once you subscribe, you can have your whole class use their iOS, Android, whatchamacallit devices to access this. It's an interactive textbook with great illustrations, animations, and films, links to uh, related nature articles, and best of all, it's updated whenever something profound is discovered in a field covered by the book. Sorry if I sound like a nature marketing person. I just love the idea. So how about a digital virology textbook? I guess you'll need a second life, though. Anyway, thanks for listening. Keep up the good work. Ben. P.S. Sorry, I know Twiv Chiefs isn't the most original ad address. I know one for your spouses, though. Twives. How about that? It's great, Ben. Yeah, very it. good. Very good. But if so, I told my my twive that, she would uh, yeah. look at me sideways. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know anything about this nature site. I'm surprised it's not it's free, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I know nothing about but, it either. Have you... I haven't tried. I'm going to try it now. I'm going to okay. look at it because it sounds great, right? Yeah. As long as it's free, I don't want to pay for it. And a digital virology textbook. We are doing the next edition of our virology textbook, and it will be digital. It will right. Be really cool uh, with all will, kinds uh, of stuff. Will yeah. it? Will it be just digital? No. Uh, ASM wants to print um, a print version as well. Okay. They say we're not ready for just digital, but it will be a digital version that has. Uh, it's online, or it's on your iPad, and it's got um, movies and quizzes and pictures interactive. We can fix it whenever we want. And that's yeah, that's the that to me. That's one of the best things about uh, digital is that it's you know can, you can edit it continuously. That's probably both a blessing and a curse, right? Yeah, it's going to be hard to find people to 
to put the work in to do that, right? But nature, of course, has a big staff that can handle that, and they pay them for that. Mm-hmm. You know, when we write textbooks, I mean, they're not going to pay us to update them, I, free, I right. presume, right? So it's a little bit of an issue. But I always thought the, the nature thing was behind a paywall, so I'll check it out, Ben. So thanks for that. That's a good idea. Uh, the next one is from David, who writes, I wanted to point out one of the important aspects of science that is often brought up in TWIV podcasts to hopefully invoke some discussion. The point is that science is a pursuit of the truth in nature. Truth is often hidden or obscured, sometimes by the complexities of nature, sometimes by people unknowingly, and sometimes by people by design. One important aspect of scientific investigations is the process taken to prevent us from deceiving ourselves. Science is a process with checks and balances, partly because some truths are hard to discern. With all the different cognitive biases we are susceptible to, it is easy to be misled by others or by ourselves. I warmly compliment all the TWIF contributors for being open to correction, a healthy attribute few seem to cultivate, especially in an election year. As Richard Feynman put it, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. P.S. I don't think that check and balances are confined to science. They occur in other fields of investigation designed to ferret out the truth. For example, journalism's who, what, when, where, why, and how, and criminal investigations, at least on TV, need to establish means, motive, and opportunity. And he gives a couple of links to cognitive uh, bias articles. This is really good. Yeah, it is good. And and, uh, he's hit on a a really important point. To me, one of the, that's really one of the, most fun things about science, if you're open to it, is uh, trying to uh, understanding what happens to your head as you're doing this stuff. Because we all, I mean, a hypothesis, after all, is in a way a bias, right? Right. So you right. create a hypothesis, you create a bias about something, and then you do an experiment and you find out that you were wrong. And I get so. Um, you know, fixed on a, so in love with a particular hypothesis that it's very difficult to twist my head around Mm. when I find out that I'm wrong. And also to, you know, cook up all of the controls that would be appropriate to prove that I'm wrong. But that whole process, in fact, is what's interesting. I'll sit there and look, sit there and look at data and I say, I'll say to people, you know, only half jokingly, this is not the way I want it to be. I want it to be different. And I have to sort of sit myself down and say, look, my job is not to um, impose my will on this system, but to understand the truth of it. And it's a very interesting process. Yeah, you've mentioned this before about how you have a bias and it's hard to get away from that. It's very interesting. I like this idea that so the truth is either hidden because nature is complex or it gets hidden by people. Right. Either unknowingly or by design, which is when they are bad. But um, and we try and design experiments to overcome this complexity. Mm-hmm. We try and design simple experiments to break down the complexity into parts, so that we can figure out what's going on. And I think that's the best part of science to right. design that. And then you reveal things that you didn't know were there. But the problem is, we're humans, and uh, we're defective in many ways, and. It clouds things. Some of us are not too smart, and uh, some of us are but don't do experiments well, so we have to work with people who can. And then there are people who want to cloud things up, which is terrible. So wouldn't it be nice if we could practice this process of getting at the truth in all aspects of human endeavor? It would be. But we don't, right? In, no. in politics, we don't. In, Especially in an election year, as he says. Yeah, and certainly um, in business, it's often people hiding things from each other, most of the time, I guess, right? Uh, economics, military, for sure. It's really sad. Yeah. It's the way our world has evolved. But science should be the pure thing, and <laughs> it's often not, because as we said before, there's not enough money. These uh, wiki links he gives are uh, impressive. There's a lot of different cognitive biases. We're yeah. very good at fooling ourselves. This is stuff scientists should learn early on. You know, we don't mm-hmm. we don't teach it, but should. Uh, 
part of the reform to science that we yeah, talked about. That's right. Where they said there, we there ought to, to be yeah. a little psychology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you're next. Okay. Stephen writes, Dear TWIV team, with all the discussion of note-taking software recently, I couldn't help but notice and be surprised by the fact that no one mentioned Microsoft OneNote. I print all of my PowerPoints and PDFs into OneNote and annotate around them uh, as seen in attached. It's probably the most robust note-taking software available, but generally has to be stored locally, unfortunately. There is an option to store all of your notes on SkyDrive, but the size of each page I was creating was too large for it. Although recently they increased the size allowed, so that I'll just have to test it again. You can also record audio or video into the page. Just thought I would contribute my bit as I think it is a perfect solution for students. I've not heard of this. Have you? I, uh, OneNote is you know bundled with um, Microsoft products, so I had heard of it, but I never used it, I must say. Um, but I'll have to look into it. Well, we'll we'll post his images and this, of course, and people can look into this because it sounds pretty nice. He's he's yep. uh, he sent some images of how he's organized his uh, his information this way. It looks pretty good. All right, all right. Thanks for that. Uh, the next one's from Amber, who writes really interesting show, well explained and super informative. I will be back. Great job. Probably the shortest email ever to Twiv. Yeah, good. Rich. Kale writes. Kale, is that how you'd pronounce that? I would think so, yeah. C-A-L-E. Dear Twiv, thanks so much for an informative and fascinating podcast. I am a young, unemployed fellow, so I spend a lot of time writing cover letters, walking the streets of Brooklyn, and lifting weights at the gym. After discovering your podcast a couple of weeks ago, your dulcet voices and revelatory viral musings have been the soundtrack to this strange lifestyle. After listening to TWIV 175, I started working my way through your back catalog, and I'm in the mid-30s already. I can't thank you enough for the free educational service you provide. Thank you so much. Best, Kale. Well, Kale could get a job writing. It's nice. Yeah. Maybe Good luck maybe with that. Maybe he's trying. Yeah. I'm glad. It's always nice to hear who's listening, right? Yeah. Next one's from Tarwin, which is an interesting name. We have Kale, and then we have Tarwin. I've been listening to your podcast for a few years now, and along with the Australian Science Show and Futures in Biotech, you've managed to teach me enough science to be able to converse and maybe even contribute to conversations with working scientists. I was always interested in science, but was put off by how slow it went in high school and ended up as a designer and programmer instead. It's interesting how many of your listeners seem to be from tech. I think it's partly because tech people listen to a lot of podcasts, but also because they think in similar, logically creative ways. And really, when it comes down to it, playing with life is so much cooler. Your How to Read a Paper in TWIV 169 was very useful and actually helped me track down, slowly connecting the dots, a paper that had information in it that might be able to help my housemate further his research when he thought it was at a dead end. On another topic, how do you track how many people listen to your podcast? The simple count of how many people subscribe to iTunes and other places may not be the best indication. Do you track the number of downloads through server logs, which would give the best idea of the actual number of downloads? Anyway, thanks again. No need to read this on air. Just wanted to say thanks. And Tarwin is from Australia, recently Silicon Valley. There's a little website here called touchmypixel.com. Hmm. It looks like artistic stuff. Huh. Cool. Uh, I use server logs, right, which are provided by the hosting service that I use. So I know exactly how many downloads. I don't. Lo I don't look at subscriptions because that's that can be off. Yeah. The most important phrase in this letter mm -hmm. is: "I was always interested in science, but was put off by how slow it went in high school." Yeah. Ugh. It's too bad. It shouldn't have been. Yeah. Slow, right. Teachers just too bad. Just having this conversation the other day about how the most important job out there is K through 12 education, and um, we really need to make that make teaching in K through 12 probably one of the most respected and respected and best paid professions in society if we're going to get anywhere. Right. So that this doesn't happen. Yep, I agree. 
Uh, I think we ought to cut it there. What do you think? Sure. We'll do some yep. picks. We got a lot of left, but that's fine. Well, not too. We got through quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. What do you got there? So I actually looked up to make sure we hadn't already picked this. Uh, I would like to formally now pick the uh, biography of Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Uh, Walter Isaacson has uh, biographed. I've picked one of his biographies before, Einstein. Um, right, right. And um, he's uh, he's uh, quite a good biographer. He uh, worked for both CNN and Time Magazine, and is now CEO of the Aspen Institute. And uh, I've not finished this book yet, but I'm far enough into it to know that I can uh, uh, recommend it highly. Steve Jobs was a an interesting character, to say the least. Absolutely. Yeah, I read it the, the week it came out. <clears throat> so I really enjoyed it. So we were talking about him the other night, and our conclusion was a brilliant guy, but a really tough guy. <laughs> yeah, I would uh, I would not <laughs> want to work with him. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that what he did could have been done by any other personality, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really great story. You'll love yeah. it. I agree. Uh, my pick is a blog called The Ocelloid, and uh, this is by someone whose name is Psi Wave Function, but she is actually a pro- <laughs> she's actually a professor at uh, Indiana University, Bloomington. It's mainly about protists. Uh, protists are micro- microbes. I would say you care... Um, Eukaryotic microbes, let's put it that way. These are small things with, with nuclei. So bacteria, of course, don't have nuclei, and, but uh, they're, they're microbes. But there are many other microbes that are very small, but they have nuclei, and they're these guys, these protists. And um, the ocelloid is actually a eye-like structure of a particular um, kind of uh, protozoan or protist. Uh, it's, probably, it's, like a, it's called a dinoflagellate single cell nucleated organism, and it has this structure that uh, basically is a sensor for light. So it's the ocelloid, that's what she's called her her blog after. And the, the reason I know this is because yesterday on TWIM we did a, a podcast about protists that live in the ocean, and um, uh, one of our co-hosts, Elio Schechter, had written a, a piece on these particular protists uh, with the author of the ocelloid, and I took a look at it, and it's pretty cool. So check it out. The only thing I don't like is that it's a Scientific American blog. And why do I don't like that? It's because I have a lot of people who are blogging for Scientific American. They get nothing, and Scientific American gets a lot of good mm. writing. And good I don't point. Th- I don't think that's fair. That's and this fair. is good writing. I read uh, I read one of these, it's very and good she's writing. Very, she's very entertaining. Now, um, it may be that they get something. I don't know. Maybe they get some money every month. That could be, in which case, fine. But I think you should do it on your own. I think you should blog on your own and make your own way. But anyway, it's a great blog, so check that out. Nice uh, pictures, too. Really nice, yeah. Um, uh, we have a couple of picks of the week. One is from La Franchie on Twitter. So this is someone who um, tweeted something before that we mentioned, which was very funny, but I can't remember what it was. But she says, hey, Tweevers, T-W-E-E-V-E-R-S. It's cool. It's French. Here is a suggestion for a next listener's pick. It's very funny and geekly. A uh, very funny and geeky Tumblr. It's called what we sh- what should we call grad school tumblr dot com, and it is basically a bunch of um, little sayings with illustrated with pictures from various things like movies. I think they're right. mostly checking if my PI has left for the weekend on Friday afternoon, and they have a picture of uh, Jack Nicholson from The Shining. Right. <laughs> And lots of cool little things here, uh, geeky stuff that only when reps act like they know science. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah, I like this. Really uh, when I when I realize my summer student is an idiot, and it <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. So pretty thanks, good. La Franche Fille. Really nice. Uh, we had a couple of other listener picks. Yeah, can to, you find them? I think so. I think I scroll up here and look for what I wrote. Do later. Just give me a minute here. Uh, I think one of them was from Neva. 
Here we go. Neva, I'm sure you have read the interesting Wired Science article, Should uh, Science Pull the Trigger on Antiviral Drugs by Carl Zimmer? Dr. Racaniello is quoted in the piece. It might be a good pick for your listeners. So that's a good one, yeah, by, by uh, Zimmer. Uh, and this is very well done. And as a matter of fact, he has a nice little uh, timeline mm-hmm. for... Uh, sort of antiviral type discoveries in it. Uh, it's it's well written. It's and uh, nicely done. And the topic is very interesting. The, uh, the generally the topic is uh, using as an approach to antivirals targeting cellular targets, which we've talked right. about. Right. Twip. So uh, the reason I'm in, quoted in it is that when Carl Zimmer was researching the article a few months before it was published, he had come across one of my lectures on antivirals online. And he called me and he or emailed me. He said, "This is really good. Can I talk to you?" So it's good that he found you know someone who's a virologist to talk to about that. And I put together lectures as part of my course, right? And he found it, so that's cool. Uh, the other pick of the week was from Sergio, who wrote, um, "Let's see." After such a long intro, it was his long letter, I have the weekly pick suggestion. Since I am a plant pathologist, I have been using for the classes I mentioned, mainly info I found in the American Phytopathological Society website. They have education materials, suggestions for professors, photographs, lessons, etc., and it is all free. They even have some material translated to Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese. So I think it is a nice pick for TWIM since plant pathogens are microbes and they deserve some publicity for the valuable material they put out here for third world countries. I must say that you are also on the same page. Perhaps the language is a barrier, but being completely open, you allow bilingual people such as myself to get informed and then pass this information to less fortunate folks. Believe it or not, it's a great service that you can't always realize from a lab bench in a prestigious university. So there you go, a pick and a compliment. <laughs> he had mentioned this for Twim pick, but I'm picking it on Twiv. It's a it's very good. extensive site. Looks great. Hope it's okay with you. Um, I have to say that um, someone in China is translating my lectures into Chinese. Oh. That's interesting. And someone in Mexico is translating them into Spanish. So uh, they're going to share those with me, and we'll put a link up once they're they're available so you can... That's my course lectures, so uh-huh. it's kind of cool, right? Yeah. That's nice. I do. I, I had a student in my class who was Russian, and she actually said she would do it in Russian. So, hey, this could be good. Uh, it's, uh, Spread it's, the word. It's, uh, it's a huge service and a big project. Yeah. But if anyone has a language they want to translate something into, contact me. All right, that is TWIV186. We went a little longer, but I think um, we need to answer these emails. I just love reading them. They're so good. Yeah, good fun. So you can uh, find us, of course, at TWIV.TV. Everything's there. That You can play the episode. You can see the links, show notes. Uh, but we're also on iTunes and the Zoom Marketplace, and there is an app that you can use to stream this to your phone, whether it's an iPhone or Android device. You can find that at microbeworld.org slash app. And do send your questions and comments to us at twiv at twiv.tv. Uh, Rich Condit can be found at the University of Florida, Gainesville, at least for the next uh, five years or so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. Always a good time. You bet. <clears throat> You're on for next week, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't see any reason why not. All right. You said you were going sailing, but I guess you'd do uh, that Yeah, afterwards. I'll leave right after TWIV. Ah, oh, what a good thing to do. Do TWIV yeah. and go sailing. What could be there better? You go. There you go. I am Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at my blog, virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.